the president of this highly revered uh, institute of which I am a member. <laughs> all the aspects of the protocol, let me adopt them as uh, I've been ably listed so that I do not waste time. My dear women in management, after that very uh, expensive introduction, <laughs> let me just um, tell you that I am one of you and that I am here for us to talk to each other as uh, woman to woman. So we just drop all those kind of things aside. <laughs> Good afternoon, the chairman of session. Good afternoon, distinguished uh, ladies and the few gentlemen here. I am indeed delighted to be amongst you today to discuss this issue, which is of very high significance to all women in the formal sector. It is an area that I have given such considerable attention that I can even qualify it as a passion. Uh, please forgive me if I do not go into many frivolities because I have uh, quite a lot of ground to cover. I am particularly intrigued by the theme of this year's gathering, women gaining the edge in a world of opportunities. Let me congratulate the leadership of the Nigerian Institute of Management for this very apt theme, which recognizes the need to prepare women managers adequately for the tremendous odds the woman who aspires to make it to the top will brave in order to climb to the summit. I therefore appreciate this opportunity for me to discuss this very, very important issue, especially as we cannot agree that the concerns of women have changed from the initial struggle we, we, we were involved in to be allowed to work to the demand now for a place at the leadership table. And that is our aspiration. The woman that enters the world of work today does not need to keep her eyes on the floor and look for that job which she will just go to and rush back to the house to prepare food and take care of the children. Women that enter the world of work today have their eyes up on the corporate ladder. The topic, Women in Leadership Lighting the Future, which I have been given, can be approached in a variety of ways, depending on the audience that you choose to address. If I focus on those of you here who are in top leadership positions, all I'll be doing is sharing experiences on how we can do better. And I'm happy to know that there are a lot of very accomplished women who are here uh, uh, that are very eager to share with the younger ones how they made it to the, the top, uh, the top post positions they got to. I know particularly the former registrar of Yaba Tech and then the regional manager from NNPC. And I'm indeed delighted that you can share your experiences because that's what we are supposed to be doing now. But having navigated the trajectory of the Federal Civil Service career ladder, as you have heard it read in my citation, I have made it to the peak. And therefore, I choose as my audience today the middle career women managers and to some extent the younger female climbers on the corporate ladder who are already asking questions about the future prospects of their careers. Will I make it? Will I not make it? I see this as a potential button change event. Why? Because most of us were already at the peak now. We are exiting, so we need to change buttons. This is a mentoring boot camp for the crop of women who will emerge as leaders to replace those of us who are presently the incumbents. That is the direction of this paper. And it is born out of my own personal conviction that women who have reached the peak of their careers, despite all the daunting odds which we are all witnesses to. We are now duty bound to seize every opportunity to capacitate and show the way to the women below. 
we have to stretch out our hands down the corporate ladder and pull up able women to populate the boardrooms, the executive suits, or the C-suits, as you call them. It is by doing this that women in leadership today can light up the future with women successors. So that is my interpretation of the topic. How do we interrogate the theme for this gathering? It shows that the women are interested in knowing the variables they can manipulate along their career paths in order to climb to the zenith. What are those variables that we can exploit? What are those opportunities along our career paths which we can make use of so that we can climb to the top? Well, in discussions like this, what I have found the most impactful is to share lessons that I have learned along the way, which became critical levers that propelled me to where I am today. So what, what did I do, having joined the civil service on grade level 08, what did I do to navigate from level 08 to 17 to permanent secretary, which is level 30? <laughs> The most important lesson that I learned early in my career is that attaining leadership is a purposive action. In modern management, leaders are not born, they are made. And once I learned that lesson, I sat up. As a young entrant into the Federal Civil Service in the mid-1980s, I was curious about how my career in the service would end and whether I would make it to the terminal grade. And as I increasingly gave thought to this, I frequently asked questions aimed at identifying those obstacles which prevent bright female managers from reaching the highest levels in the Federal Civil Service. You, you, can, you can be bright, you can have first class, you can be the best, and yet you won't make it. I didn't understand that. Because having gone through school, the most brilliant was first came first to class. But when we started working, I discovered that it wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I sought to find out why. And naturally, this influenced the choice of research focus for my master's degree program in the University of Lagos, which afforded me the opportunity to study the ratio of occupation of senior management grades by women. I'm sure the president of the Nigerian Institute of Management will be interested in knowing that despite this large number you are seeing, we are still in the minority. <laughs> so then, when I conducted my research, it was 27.54% as compared to men, 72.46%. But now, you know, con conducting a rapid uh, uh, statistics using my office, I discovered that we had gotten to 30%. And with these statistics, I was able to analyze the pattern of inclusion of women, this distribution and structure of opportunities, which led to my conclusion that although there are many women working for government, you see women everywhere, only few of them do important work that has to do with decision making. And this was the beginning of my quest to determine those variables that improve or reduce the chances of women making it to top management positions, particularly the effects of setting myths and stereotypes on the prospect of women ascending to leadership positions in the world of work. In effect, I embarked on a scholarly journey which revealed the behavior in organizations that militate against women, and which are indeed the same formidable barriers that prevent the advancement of women into leadership and power positions universally. That's why it is because of these same reasons that we have very few women in the National Assembly, that a woman has not become president of this great country. So we still have a long way to go. Now, let me start uh, by establishing the theoretical framework for this discourse. A fundamental aspect of management is coordinating the activities of groups 
and directing the efforts of their members towards the goals and objectives of the organization, and this involves leadership. There are many ways of looking at leadership and many interpretations of its meanings. It is essentially a relationship through which one person influences the behavior of other people. Although leadership is a special attribute which can be distinguished from other elements of management, a common view is that the job of the manager, which comprises planning, organizing, staffing, and controlling, combining the human and material resources to achieve desired objectives, requires the ability of leadership to exercise those functions effectively. In other words, even if you know all these other aspects of management and you don't have the ability of leadership, it will be very, very difficult for you to be effective in the discharge of these other management uh, functions. The uh, revered uh, management uh, guru, Harold Kunz, defined leadership as influence. That's the definition of adopting the art or process of influencing people so they, that they will strive willingly towards the achievement of good goals with zeal and with confidence. Within an organization, leadership influence usually depends on the type of power that the leader can exercise over other people. And five main sources of power upon which the influence of the leader is based have been identified by scholars. They are reward power, uh, that is ability, uh, let me not go into the details because of time, coercive power, legitimate power, reference power. As management scholars, I believe we all know this expert power. And due to its complex and variable nature, there are many ways of analyzing leadership, just as there are major theories and research concerning leadership. But there are certain variables that have been agreed by scholars that affect leadership effectiveness. National culture has been singled out as a major variable which affects leadership style and the perception of leadership. <laughs> This is because leadership relationship takes place within a cultural context. And the social, economic, and political environment affects the leadership relationship together with the attitudes and the needs of followers. We, we talked about attitudes here. And it's one of the very, very important factors that influence leadership, really. The, one of the uh, scholars who has done a lot of work on the uh, influence of uh, culture and leadership is Gate of Seed, who said that culture is collective programming. And he conducted a large scale research study across the world from which he concluded that masculinity as a dimension of culture refers to a continuum between masculine characteristics such as assertiveness and competitiveness and feminine traits such as caring, a stress upon the quality of life and concern with the environment. Now, why is this important to us here? It is important because it is this cultural dimension of leadership that has affected the quality of women's participation in organizations. And it is because in every culture there is an imagined life pattern of women and this leads to their being lured into positions which fit into the life rules defined by the values and beliefs of each society which is transmitted from generation to generation through the process of socialization and education. The consequence is that up to recently women's roles were stereotyped and supervisory and leadership positions were said to require a set of traits defined as unfeminine and therefore not seen as belonging to women. Nkechi Mwanko uh, even provides an ironic dimension to the situation. She said in her book, Gender Equality in Nigerian Politics, these religious attitudes and cultural affirmations of women's supposed inferiority and capability to lead has sunk so deeply into the psyche of many women that they do not only believe it, but may fight any attempt to change the status quo. Even women who, on a conscious level, do not believe that women are inferior to males, males also discriminate against their daughters in the provision of opportunities and the sharing of household chores. Unconsciously, Many 
most women have internalized the inferior and subordinate status and no longer realize when their actions may be helping to perpetuate the situation. Any woman who believes that females can never make good leaders will naturally never vote for women in elections. They will also raise their daughters as inferior to their sons. Their children are likely to grow up with the idea that the natural order of life is that of male superiority, end of quote. You know, Kechimwanko even went further to give the instances of how we share uh, household chores in the house. We tell the boy, go and play football or go, and then the girl go and wash feet. So when you are doing that as a woman, you are perpetuating this particular uh, uh, position, culture, cultural uh, perception of women. Now, in the Nigerian civil service where I have made my career, the senior management class in any ministry comprises officers on grade level 14 and above. In some ministries, only the director in CADA, that is assistant director, deputy director, director and permanent secretary, constitute the senior management. In most, uh, the senior management is the group from which the policy directions for the management of each ministry emanate. And the leadership of the civil service centers on this important group which controls the distribution of power, resources, and opportunities available in each federal ministry. They ensure that policy questions have been thoroughly examined at the official level before they are put to the ministers for deliberation. Thus, leadership in the public service is best understood within the context of its operational, advisory, and management rules. And there is certainly a requirement of intellectual rigor experience and stamina, physical stamina, to discharge the advisory and policy analysis rules in the higher service. In most federal ministries, the ratio of occupation of positions by male and female managers shows a love side deadness that favors men, as women usually make up just about 30% of the senior management class presently. Now, although the aggregate number of women employed in government services is significant, we will see many women milling around, but most of them do an important work. They pre pre predominate at low level cadres that peak at the middle management levels. I mean, these are women who join the civil service as secretaries, executive and clerical officers, which are regarded as women work. And they will hit the glass ceiling on reaching grade level 40 and exit. So the import of this is that the pattern of inclusion of women in any organization will determine whether their career trajectory will ultimately take them to the top or lead to their attrition when the narrow stream occurs at middle management. So that's the first explanation. How, what, uh, have you looked at your cadre where you are? Does it lead to the top? Or is it something that in the middle you will just be walking around and around until you fizzle out? Then, a second explanation for women's low visibility in topmost positions in corporate organizations can be attributed to the inequalities in the distribution and the structure of opportunity between men and women. The distribution of opportunity refers to an employee's expectations and future prospects in a position the structure of opportunity is shaped by promotion rates from particular grades, the career ladder associated with a particular position, the access to organizationally recognized challenges, and the increase in skills and rewards. Now, there are certain positions. Women in the civil service who predominate in low-level cadres, such as secretarial, clerical, and executive of grades, they have shorter career ladders that do not terminate. They will never terminate in leadership position. Now, remember we're talking about the structure of opportunity. So if you are already in a low-level cadre, you will never, you are going to face a blocked opportunity at the end. Therefore, in the distribution of opportunity as far as it relates to an employee's expectations and future prospects in a position, female civil servants are clearly disadvantaged because the majority of them will leave the service without advancing into any important position. 
at the topmost levels of the public sector. Appointment is at the pleasure of the president. Women lose out easily in this game because they lack political power, which men cultivate on their way to top management. I'm sure they, they, uh, one of our participants here from NNPC can testify to that because with all her qualifications and her knowledge of the ground, she, she doesn't know where she is. Where she is. <laughs> it's the politics of, in the system. The men cultivate it, they know how to play it very well. And we women, we lack political power. We don't know how to play that game. From 1994 to 1997, when political clout was the dominant factor in the appointment of permanent secretaries, there was no female federal permanent secretary. Those that were given political appointments of directors general during that period were not even appointed from the mainstream federal civil service. The implication of this is that the few women who make it to the terminal grade may not even aspire to the leadership post of permanent secretary unless such appointment emerges from a competitive, merit-driven process. Now, the structure of opportunity refers to access to organizationally recognized challenges and the increase in skills and rewards. In the civil service as in other organizations, there are certain positions that are highly visible. And because they expose the occupants to power and provide invaluable training ground and exposure to higher responsibilities. The PECO sites agreeing to the occupants of such a position 